So good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining today's session. I'm Sean Gibb. I'm the Events and Marketing Manager at Pro Manchester. I'm delighted to welcome you to Understanding Your Personality Type and Your Organisation's Personality Type, hosted by the Oak Ridge Centre. Following today's session, I'll send out a post-event email which will contain any post-event collateral links to where you can find out more on this topic and more um, Pro Manchester events. Um, and it'll also include our feedback form. So if you could just spare a couple of minutes to fill in this feedback form, it'll really help us uh, to continue to provide consistently great events. Just a few points of housekeeping. Uh, please be aware that this webinar is being recorded. Feel free to use the chat function to ask any questions, make any comments, observations. And if you could please all just keep your microphones on mute for the time being. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Kevin Charlesworth, Senior Associate at the Oak Ridge Centre. Well, thanks very much, Sean. So welcome to this um, workshop. Um, I'm a business psychologist um, and business coach. Um, and I use this um, personality approach in a lot of the training and the coaching that I do. And what we're about today is understanding your personality type um, in the context of the personality type of your organization. Uh, one of the issues around these kind of workshops is the full range um, of delegates and I'm sure there are some of you that have done a lot on personality already and you should be up here doing the, the teaching and the training and there'll be those who are kind of new to it um, but just that's just how it how it goes if you are well experienced in this what I the way I would approach this hour is okay what are the applications of all these personality profiling models and how can I use it in my organization and other organizations if you're new to even thinking about your personality type and those of, uh, of those uh, around you that work with you uh, well just enjoy uh, and it's my job to enthuse about um, personality types and how it can be used in businesses and organizations to massively improved performance. Uh, I want to go straight into an exercise because uh, to get us kind of up and running uh, and during this workshop Natalie is going to be helping me so thank you Natalie. Um, we've got a slide here which just says uh, tea bag exercise here's a tea bag uh, make a list of what you see so uh, could you get your pen and paper which I've asked you to bring along with you um, and could you literally, even as I'm speaking to you, uh, write down to at least the minimum of 10 things that you see when this um, tea bag slide comes up? Um, so just do them as bullet points. Some of you already will be on items six and seven. Some of you will be struggling with the whole exercise and that's fine. That's probably down to your personality type. So the question is, what do you see? Write down 10 things. And we're going to be using this later on. While you're doing that, let me just tell you about some of the aims of, of this hour coming up. Um, uh, above all, I want to enthuse with you around um, the concept of you personally having a personality <laughs> and informing those around you what that is. Uh, and the concept is that individually you have to understand your personality type, uh, but also to enthuse about the concept of the organisation in which you sit also has a personality. Um, and one of the, the maxims I work by is you can't manage something unless you understand it. You can't manage something unless you understand it. So I would go as far as to say it's really difficult for you to manage yourself unless you can understand how you're put together. And it's virtually impossible to, to kind of manage within or manage and change an organisation if you don't really understand it. You haven't got the vocabulary to describe what type of organization it is. 
So when I say type of organization, I'm not talking about what product you, you provide or what services you provide or what sector you're in. I'm talking about the, the soul. Some call it culture, the, the mind, the heart, the, the will of the organization. And um, that can be understood and it can be described and ultimately it can be managed. For those of you in the know, we're going to be using one personality model, which is the Myers-Briggs model. There's lots of models out there. Um, I just happen to use this, this particular one. Um, a particular ground rule for you is during this hour, I think to maximize your learning and fun and interest is if you put on curiosity. <laughs> And the way I'd like you to do that is to ask yourself questions, write down questions that you've got of me. We're going to have a Q&A session at the end, but also use the chat facility. And even as we're going through this, your personality type may be that um, as you're listening to me doing an exercise, um, all of a sudden from left field may come a question that you want to ask of me, um, capture it put it on the chat and we'll try and uh, address those towards the end of, of the hour. So put on curiosity. Big challenge for those of us who are well into this as a subject, um, but um, I would recommend that you do that. We've got some outcomes for the workshop. Um, you're gonna end up with um, four letters um, on for yourself. Um, four dimensions of personality for you as a person. Uh, you're going to end up with four letters, a description, a personality description for your organisation. If you're outside of an organisation at the moment, you can go back, flip back to the one that you were in before, or you've got an opportunity to choose which organisation to focus on this morning. And then, I'm choosing my words carefully here, but... Um, trust me when I say this, that I want you to be thinking about um, the personality profile of your partner. That's not business partner. We're going domestic here. Uh, if you don't have a partner, that's fine. You could find some significant other in your family. So it could be your father or your mother or a sibling. Um, we'll come to all that later, but... Um, Trust me when I say most people's learning around personality, although it's very useful for businesses, comes from them understanding themselves and understanding the personality of those very, very close to them. Uh, so you won't be sharing any of that, uh, but I would like you to be thinking. So you'll end up with a piece of paper, a bit like mine here. It says Kevin INFP. My organization, which is the Oak Ridge Center, is ENFP, which we'll come to in a bit. And my partner happens to be ESTJ, which those amongst you may quickly see that um, my partner is diametrically opposed to me. I'm INFP, she's ESTJ. For those of you who know Myers-Briggs, that makes perfect sense. For those who don't, um, don't panic. We're going to come to this slowly, um, bit by bit. Um, and then we're gonna have some um, real actions as a result of the um, workshop. And I'm gonna give you, if you don't take anything else away, seven things to do with this understanding of your personality type and the personality type of your organization. Seven real pragmatic things that you can do when you've hit the leave button and you grab yourself some time. There's seven things I think you can do which will enhance not only your business performance, but the performance of your organization. So um, here's, here's what I'd like us to do first. So Natalie, if we could go to slide three, and um, I'm gonna lead as gently, and bear with me those of you who know Myers-Briggs, um, uh, but this really is a refresher for you. And also for those who have not entered into this world of personality profiling, I'm going to take you very quickly, hopefully, very simply to establish your 
personality profile using the Myers-Briggs model. You're going to end with four letters that will describe your profile. And the first pair of letters are extroversion and introversion. As I'm speaking to you, particularly if this is new to you, I want you to choose between this slide, which says extroversion, and the next slide, which says introversion. And it's just, you just choose one or the other. And um, so if your personality dimension on this particular profile is that you're an extrovert, you will speak, think, and speak, um, which rudely means that you're good at talking and that you tend to talk out loud. And extroverts say those things of, um, I, didn't know I, know, I didn't know that I knew that until I'd said it. That's a trait of extroversion. They enjoy energetic atmosphere. So, uh, and the, the, this dimension of personality is where you get your energy from. So if you get your energy, find yourself getting energy from other people, then you would be, an extrovert for the purpose of this exercise. Um, an example would be my wife, who's got a very busy job. When she comes home, she gets on the phone to her friends and family for more people. For, and so she re-energizes from a busy people job by engaging with more people because that uh, fires up her batteries more and helps her. Um, so they enjoy an energetic atmosphere. They're early starters, so if you give them a problem, they've already kind of jumped into it already. Um, so there's extroversion, something about quickness. So if you're given a project as an expert, you're already kind of into it already. If you've got the, an, an idea about going on a holiday somewhere, then you, you're an early starter. People would call them fast, as it were. They share thoughts freely. That's the famous extrovert um, characteristic. They prefer action, which is a bit sad if you're on a workshop, you want to get into an exercise and start doing things and talking to people and all that. Uh, so the corollary is true that listening is probably more difficult. And um, this is an interesting one for extroversion, uh, that you tend to have lots of interests and in the nicest possible way, lots of friendships. So if you open the garage door of an extrovert, why would you do that? But if you did, you would probably in that garage, you would probably see a pair of skis, roller skates, um, a tennis racket, um, just diff things, uh, artifacts to describe lots of different interests. Um, and that's extroversion. So Natalie, next slide, please. <coughs> and um, the way these dimensions work is that they're polar opposites. And what I, just to remind you, what I want you to do as we go through this is to th look at these twin slides that I'll be presenting you, and you choose whether you're, in this case, an extrovert or, or in this case, a, an introvert. And just by the way, um, if you capture me on your gallery somewhere, here I am. Um, on the label, Zoom label, I'm shown as Kevin, Kevin Charlesworth, um, and my four letters are already there. That's what I want to build for you. So if you're ahead of the game, you could maybe be getting onto your, um, your label facility and change that to an INFP. Probably, Natalie, when I've done these couple of slides, we'll just have a quick pause and I'll ask you, Natalie, if you would, to uh, uh, describe um, how to do that. Anyway, back to this initial dimension of personality. This is a preference. Are you an extrovert? Do you prefer extroversion? Or are you attracted to, do you have a preference for introversion? And it's the complete opposite. It's um, you have a tendency to think more than speak. And introverts talking about having to drag out of themselves what they've been thinking about. It's not a kind of natural process. Um, their natural process is to reflect and to, um, to uh, provide space and time for themselves to 
um, do the very thing of thinking. They tend, therefore, to guard their thoughts until nearly perfect. I'm not saying any of these are a good thing, it's just a description. I'm not saying any of these are a bad thing, it's just a description. So they tend to guard their thoughts until nearly perfect. And so introversion tend to need to be asked to, um, to uh, kind of give their opinion or give their ideas, part of introversion. So they're known to consider and think deeply. This is an interesting one. They tend to defend against intrusions because people can de-energize opposite to extroversion. And if you're an introvert and you have too many people um, over a short space of time, they, the, the tendency is to want to provide space and time, as it says on the last two bullet points here, uh, to uh, engage in this kind of introverted behavior, which is to reflect and think. And um, it also says there that they tend to contain feelings. There's a gender issue there, but I'm not going to dive into that. So extrovert, introvert, on your piece of paper, put E or I. And if you're able to do it under your Zoom label, could you... Um, put your name like Sharon E, meaning Sharon's an extrovert. Natalie, do you just want to intervene there and just help people maybe sh um, show them how to do that? I will, but we have had a question in the chat as well, Kev, which I think might be worth covering at, at this point, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, someone has asked, what if you're a mixture of both? Right, great question. I will answer that straight away. Um, the, the, the kind of technical answer to that is that um, it, you should maybe go back to when you first started going to big school, 11, 12, and ask yourself the same question. Um, which of those do, would you be attracted to most, the extroversion or the introversion? And plump for one of those. Um, it is actually possible to be in the middle what it tends to mean is that you're not, you're not either one or the other, you're both and. Um, but I would, for the purpose of this exercise, encourage you to go one way or the other. Um, there is also another way of accessing the kind of the real you, so to speak. Um, I told you one about when you're 11 or 12. Also, when you go on holiday, that's kind of 80% accurate as well, is what are you attracted to? Activity, people, action, or reflection, sit on the beach, slow down, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so those two things, if you put them together, will probably sway you either way. Natalie. Thanks, Kevin. I've just popped in the chat a couple of ways which you can um, update your name. Um, so you can either right click on your video, and find rename in the drop down. If that doesn't work, you can click on the three dots that appear in the top right hand corner of your video when you hover over your own face and find rename in the drop down there. And I can see that quite a few people have started adding E's and I's, and we've got a couple of people who know their full profile as well, which is great. Brilliant. Okay, thanks, Natalie. Um, we're going to go on now. Um, straight away to the second dimension, uh, which, so if you go to slide six, Natalie. Okay. Oh. Uh, that's great. Uh, and why are we doing this? We're doing this, for those of you who know this, it's just a gentle reminder, but I want you to be thinking about how you can apply this and then to your organization coming up. For those who don't, it's a kind of an introduction. Um, uh, but the premise is that understanding yourself is well worth doing for millions of reasons. Understanding the context, the family, the extended family, the hobby group that you're a part of, and the, the business organization you find yourself in as well is absolutely critical for the impact that you have there. You can't do either unless you have the vocabulary, I would posit. Um, that's why we're kind of laboring some of these words here. So the second dimension we're coming to is a sensing one or thinking. S 
So if you are attracted to these bullet points, it would be an S on your second letter. Um, and that comes from the word sensing, which refers to the five um, to the five senses, so that you tend to be very attuned to those five senses. Um, also, you tend to do what's called convergent thinking, which is going from the general to the particular, as the gentleman looking through his microscope there. Convergent thinking is what you do by preference. And then uh, that tends to be a kind of focused way of thinking. So you're attracted to talking in specific terms, value realism, proceed step by step. Don't like being overloaded with abstract theories. Myers-Briggs model might be a bit of a problem or the, the concept of it. You'd be into, well, what does this mean? What's the pragmatic use of it? Uh, what, why do those letters mean what they mean? Uh, you tend to be convergent in your approach to this particular theory. Uh, you prefer the tried and tested and you want to know what is. So even as we're going through this workshop, you'll be lots of detailed questions will be firing up. Uh, that would tend to mean that you have this kind of sensing approach to, um, to, uh, to life in general. Um, let me just pause there before we go on to the next slide, Natalie, and just to remind you of your list of the tea bag. If you could just list, look at that list there. For those who've joined and missed the tea bag exercise, I've asked people to look at the tea bag. We had a picture of the tea bag, and I just asked the question, what do you see? If you're S, and we don't have the time to get your answers here, if you're S, you have a predominant list with of sensing so it'll say things like um it's square it's white it's got a string it's filled with tea um, and it will also do this thing of uh, pragmatism and realism um, so i've had people in face-to-face -face workshops shouting at me saying it's a tea bag you know and so um you will probably have if not written down you'd be tempted to say it's a tea bag it's a tea bag. Um, so that would give you an indication anecdotally of whether you're a sensor or not. Next slide, please, Natalie. And here we go with the complete opposite. And this is this dimension is to do with the way that um, information is important to you or not. And so all those bullet points there, I'll let you skim read them as I'm talking to you. But if you're attracted to those things, that would mean that you have this divergent way of thinking. You go from the particular to the general. So if I said to you holidays and you were an intuit, you would probably set, be thinking of all the different places you could go. You might even ask the question, in your intuitive way of thinking is why do we have holidays? Um, you might be thinking about different types or categories of holidays. That would suggest you're intuitive. Um, you might be thinking, what else could we do if we didn't go on holiday? So whereas if you're sensing, you'd be thinking specifically and pragmatically about where you've been, the hotels you've been to, what you did when you were there, how long you spent there, how much it cost, etc. Is one better than the other? Not at all. And when I was learning about this stuff um, some years ago now, the uh, trainer saw I was struggling with this. And uh, there was, you know, this idea that you kind of need both in life. You need the sensing, the S, the detail, the focus, but you also need kind of big picture. And I was struggling as to kind of which was the best and all that. And he said, Kevin, what's more important, breathing out and breathing in or breathing in? And to my shame, I went, <laughs> you know, and he said, no, you need both, you numpty. Uh, and it's the same in life with divergence and convergence. Um, I think all you can possibly say in business or in family 
is it's best for to maybe look at the big picture first and then dive into detail afterwards. Uh, but that's to do with how you organize the culture around you. Uh, but in terms of preference, 50% of the uh, of, of the UK population um, have a preference for sensing, in which case you'd be an S, 50% N. Go on to the next slide, Natalie, and I'll just give you all an opportunity um, to look at the two lists together, look at your piece of paper against your name, you've got introversion or extroversion, and you've got S or N. Um, it says I there, I've made a mistake. <laughs> Uh, it should be N, um, and just put that down. Okay, we're going to crack on, and we're going to come very quickly to looking at your organisation using this model. Um, I just want, uh, Natalie, if you turn to uh, slide 11 straight away, we'll do this quickly. This is the third dimension, and by the way, in my experience, this is the more difficult one. Um, it takes a bit of thought maybe to place yourself personally within these two dimensions um, uh, but if you could do that so even as I'm talking to you look at that left hand column the thinking column and ask yourself the question do I am I attracted to that way or am I attracted to the right hand column to the feelings one and it's usually with reference to how you make decisions how you buy a washing machine, how you decide on the next project to tackle, um, how you deal with an HR problem that you've got, where do you go first? Um, and again, in my experience, um, I've had a lot of people come up to me after workshop and say, I can do both. And it's absolutely necessary for life in general and business in general to be able to be logical, left-hand column, but also sensitive on the right-hand column. Um, but a way of approaching this is you probably have a preference. And how you get to that preference is when you're facing a decision, where do you go first? Do you go logic, detachment, critical, tough-minded, do the right thing? You'd be going attracted to the the left hand column, or do you first go, oh my word, how is this problem going to affect me? How is it going to affect others? Um, I'm really concerned about this. I need to talk to some other people and get their views about it. Do you go F before you? And most managers I've worked with like to think that they do both, and I'm sure they do, but probably their preference is to be attracted to one first, and then they have to decide to do the second one. So, are you T or F, in which case you'd have your third letter? And we'll move quickly on, Natalie, to that uh, last dimension, which is tw 12, please. Uh, and this is the fourth dimension. This is to do with how you organize yourself um, and life in general. Some great words here um, uh, about being systematic, seeing routines as effective, being early starting, being scheduled, organized. Um, at Christmas, you'd prefer to tell people what, um, what presents you want so that it kind of fits in with what you've got already. Uh, so you tend to limit surprises. Um, and you go for two amazing things called closure and completeness. Um, and then very quickly, Natalie, if you move to the last slide on the, uh, that's it. P for perceiving, the complete opposite of the J, the judging one. And um, this is to do with um, the way that you manage your life and time and people around yourselves and responsibilities as you tend to be casual, open-ended, pressure prompted, spontaneous and emergent. I've got a, a a very derogatory picture there to denote that, but I think you can see where we're going with that. Next slide, Natalie, those two lists together and do what I've been asking you to do all together, which is piece together. Are you a J or are you a P? 
Um, and so on the gallery now, as we're going through this, um, if you can manage to get into the Zoom label function, you should have your name, first name, and then um, four letters. So it'd be ESTJ or INFP or whatever. Evan, can I ask a question, please? Yes. Um, is it true that if you're perceiving, it's like you can more easily, this probably sounds like a real layman's term, which it is, but like more easily put yourself in other people's shoes, like kind of understand from their perspective? Yeah. Is that, that, uh, that could be a combi Sorry, what is the question? Um, so that if you are more perceiving, um, yeah. it, does it mean that you can kind of more easily put yourself in other people's shoes, like un understand from their perspective? Or have I just sort of learned? No, it could, it could be that. Often these behaviours are combinations of the two, but there could be some F in there as well from that second dimension, uh, which right. means that you, uh, you, you kind of you notice how other people are feeling mm. and that, that, that kind of drags you into putting yourself in their shoes if you're more p you're more able to do that stop what you're thinking put that to one side and go and enter into someone else's world um, right probably and there's a wonderful thing going on here which is the cocktail of your dime of your personality damage clearly we haven't got time to dive into that but the great conversations i've had with people around you know, how does my extroversion work with my, which is E, work with my J? I say, well, what do you mean? And they realize that extroversion is to do with speed, um, moving on, gathering more things, doing more activity. That's extroversion. But I'm a J. Oh, my word. Which means I like completing things and I like finishing things and I, I need to stop something before I move on to something else. And so in their world, they talk personally about a clash between those two things. But we're diving into kind of Premier League Myers-Briggs stuff, which is wonderful. And I would encourage you all to Google this kind of stuff. Please get in touch with me, Oak Ridge, bit of a plug there. But um, the, there's real value in having the vocabulary to describe what's going on within you so that you can refer it to other people and to other organizations which we're going to be looking at just now um, could you turn uh natalie to 25 it, it, that was a great question thank you for that um and if you could be others of you putting other questions in and we'll try and pick up some more towards the end um, Right, what I'm going to lead you in now is your, the personality type of your organisation. How can this be? It's an organisation. If you're an S, you might find this difficult, but hey, you know, just bear with it. Um, you, my premise is that your organisation has, you might call it a soul with a little S. It's got a kind of thought process. It's got an approach. Um, I also believe it's almost like organic or biological. It's made up of people that are organic and biological. Um, even the name that we give big organizations um, betrays the fact that there is something living and breathing and warm, so to speak, about your organization. If you're in a big organization, you might even call it a corporation. And a corporation means just the very thing, a body. It is a body. And my premise is the organization in which you're sitting at the moment um, has a personality type. The, before we kind of look at yours, let me just tell you a quick story. I was working in AstraZeneca and um, I was working with a middle manager there who asked me to work with his team to look at the personality type of the individuals within his team so they could manage the dynamics and also um, the personality of their team which we won't have time to get into just now 
Um, so we did what I did with you. We took about three hours, by the way, uh, to uh, piece together people's um, personality profiles. And there were a lot of wow moments and penny drop moments as the team looked at one another and recognized we have cognitive difference and diversity in our team. That was one of the biggest learning of all teams is how different we all are. But all of a sudden they had vocabulary words, stories to be able to describe my difference other than you're different, I don't get you, you're the same as me, I love you to bits. Um, and so we had a great time talking about that. It occurred to me after that three hours of working with individually that they kept referring to them, their organization, it, which was AstraZeneca, the umbrella corporation. And so I stopped the, uh, we had a cup of coffee, stopped that particular personal view of personality, said, okay, let's work out the personality of AstraZeneca. How can we possibly do that? We picked a random person and did a bit of body voting. And I asked these very questions in front of you of their organization. And as it happens, um, the AstraZeneca came out as ISTJ. Um, I meaning rather slow moving and everyone went, yeah, definitely slow moving. S, data driven um, into regulation and doing the right thing. Yes, it was S. T, logical, rational, indeed scientific. So it was a massive T and protocols, procedures coming out of their ears. It was a J. So as a body, they just went, they stared at AstraZeneca and said, it is ISTJ. Anyway, the point of sharing that story is the middle manager I was working with was ISTJ. <laughs> and he was jumping up and down saying, yeah, I love this organization, it's brilliant. But there were also, there was one ENFP person in that team and they had a different view of their organization, the difficulty of working with an organization that doesn't particularly match their personality type. And we had a whale of a time in the afternoon talking about wow how do we interface with an organization that's massively istj anyway so let's do your organization so if you could write down on your piece of paper the name of your organization we're going to do the same thing and walk through what your four letters would be so if you're an extrovert organization it's those things energetic atmosphere fast moving they tend they start lots of projects they get to action quickly and they tend to this thing of lots of lots of projects lots of initiatives lots of depots lots of um lots of documents that they want to promote lots of people they want to talk lots of lots of in which case you would be an extrovert organization let's move over to introversion the complete opposite is slow moving, reflective, considers and thinks deeply, and it takes its time. So it's ponderous. It is historic. So it spends a lot of time looking about what's happened in the past and um, is not so keen to maybe move forward. Um, so very quickly, if you could think about what where you would put your organization, E or I. We're going to move on. Next one, Natalie. This is crucial for your organization. And if I got any time with you thinking about you and how you interact with your organization, this is where I'd spend most of my time, which is um, the data that's important to the, the organization. Um, and on the sensing side, on the left hand side, it likes data, it's pragmatic, it's bureaucratic, likes checking things and it evaluates. It just does that as a natural kind of process. So when you're thinking out loud as a leadership team, um, if it's a sensing organization, there will be protocols around, okay, we'll capture the minutes. Um, and then some, there'll be a sense in which the organization will say, well, before you never have a next meeting, let's evaluate the meetings to make sure that it's worth having these meetings. <laughs> um, 
it likes checking things. How did things go? Um, that would tend to move it towards the soul of a sensing organization. And over to the right hand side, uh, the N that should be uh, for intuitive organization. And same thing as your individual personality prefers the new and tried, jumps from step to step, desire for change, they love looking at future possibilities. Um, they've got a great imagination and originality. So it's that idea of, um, it's called star thinking as an organization. We've spotted something over here that we could do. Um, so not to be confused with what certain individuals within your organization do, but try when you're trying to assess your organization, think of the corporate, the body. Um, and yeah, you can end up in the middle, um, but try and say if you're an N or an S. Next one, Natalie. Wow, this is huge for organizations. <laughs> is, is it logical, reasonable, detached, search for flaws, critical and tough-minded? I think you'll know straight away if your organization's like that. Or is it on towards the right-hand side, the feelings-based, um, interest in others, compassionate, accommodating? You can read it as well as I. Um, so when you think about your organization, really difficult to do, but would you put it as a T or an F? Um, and then finally, um, I'd say thank you. Uh, this is critical as well um, for your sanity as a person within the corporation of your organization is have you noticed if it's particularly J or P? So if, if your organization is attracted to systems, routines, schedules it itself limits the prices and it's into closure and completeness uh, then it clearly would be a j if it's looking at the other thing it would be casual open-ended pressure prompters spontaneous emergent then it would be a p hazard a guess of, as to the four letters of your organization and so you'd end up with your on the label if you can do this your first name the name of your four letters, ESTJ, ESFJ, or whatever. And now um, the four letters of your organization. Simone, could you come off mute and just have a chat with us? Sure. Hello. Hello. Hi. Do you want to just quickly say who you are and what you do? Sure, um, I'm Simone. I am the Interim Managing Director for the Oak Ridge Centre and I've been in post for the last nine months. So yes, Kevin, are you going to ask me about the personality of the Oak Ridge Centre? Yeah. <laughs> oh, Corks, okay. Well, I can tell you what it is. If you're... Okay, great, go for but, it. Yeah. The, the fact is uh, both Simone and I and Natalie and Anita, if you're on the line there, uh, we all work for the Oak Ridge Centre. Uh, we're all very different. <laughs> And, um, but because we've got Simone here, who's um, standing in as CEO just now, and probably more significantly, Simone, just joined the organization. Um, I, I've just got a few questions for you, just to see how this might play out in the different delegates organizations. So Simone, what, what are your four letters? For Mine. You, for you personally. Oh, E-N-T-J. Okay. So, um, team, uh, what that means is Simone is active. She's kind of passionate in what she does. She engages people, being glowingly positive about you here, Simone. <laughs> Thank you. So she's an extrovert. Um, and it's also N, which is intu an intuit, so has big ideas about what the organization can do. Um, different to its past, and that's normal for an intuit. Uh, for T means that you approach problems and issues as a, what's the right thing to do? What's a reasonable, logical thing to do? And I can hear those of you at T going, well, how else would you live life? <laughs> but there are people who do it differently. And then J, which is um, attracted to completeness and closure and decision-making. 
And that's Simone to a T. Now, here's a question, Simone. You live in and work in an organization which is ENFP. Mm -hmm. Okay, ENFP. Yeah. That's the Oak Ridge Center. Um, so what what do you like? What, what what how do you find working in the organization as an ENTJ? Or let me ask you dive straight in. What, what do you find difficult working in the organization? Um, well, I mean, sometimes I think it's um, that there is a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of um, let's let's look and see what the information is and what others are doing and and how how would that be in the market? And, you know, like that thought, a lot of a lot of process um, which needs to be there. And I do recognize that, you know, but sometimes I'm like, no, oh, let's just give it a go and see what happens. Right, and, let's uh, put, just pause you there. So what Simone's got going on is this kind of extrovert intuitive thing which probably is bigger even than the Oak Ridge one does that kind of make sense so they share that similarity but um Simone's extroversion kicks in did you hear that kind of fast move clap of hands let's go with it and so good that you work in an extrovert organization that's got a bit of activity about it but you can see there's still a bit of disparity there how about the J and P difference there, Simone? How do you find that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not one for surprises. I have to be honest, you know, so I, I do like to kind of say, right, this is this is where we're going. But what's beautiful about the Oak Ridge Centre is that I'm surrounded by people who are P's. I mean, you know, look at yourself, Kevin, you know, and it's a, and so I think I think it works in our favour. We've got that balance. Um, so and, and because we are very collaborative, um, you know, we're collegiate in our approach. It's it's good. But uh, yeah, I like systems. I do like routine. I mean, I like things to fit. Finish. Um, but um, you know, in, in the Oak Ridge Centre, if you described it as an organisation, it's you know, it, for me, it is professional and and incredibly well grounded, but also very caring and very um, friendly. Um, so that 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 is the balance, and that's yeah. the people you, within it. You could probably notice if you if you came into the Oak Ridge Centre, you would notice the F thing going on, which is the lots of networking, friendliness interest in one another and all that kind of thing with the F um, but and I think Simone if I may I think you you've also brought alongside although you enjoy that side of things is the the challenge the let's do the right thing what do you think about this it's great to get on on all of that but how about this which is that what what pe other people might see as a as a contrast or a difference but within our organization, um, we're helping and using Simone to challenge that in effect. And so anyway, thank you very much, Simone. Um, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Kevin. I just wanted to engage one of our people just to show how these kind of things might work in your organization. Is you take your personality and rather and as you're growing and learning about that, is you recognize how it clashes with some aspects of your organization that you work in but also how you fit in in some other areas and if you look just look at those different four letters you'll be able to probably tease out um, where you, you kind of having difficulty or what's working swimmingly for you um, just a word before i want to go to some q and a's just now um, but obviously this can be approached, can be done with your team. So you work out your personality type and the personality type of all the team, and then you work out the personality type of, um, type of the whole team. I did that once with a team uh, in the Northwest, a high performing team with about, ended up with six or seven members of that team, but I joined as number two. And, um, after member number five joined, uh, I asked my manager, what is the basis on which you're doing your recruiting? <laughs> and uh, to cut a long story short, she was an ENFP and she'd recruited me as an INFP and the third person recruiter was an ENFP and the fourth person recruiter was an INFP. And we, we, we suddenly realized, or she suddenly realized, whoa, stop. 
and we the next two people that we recruited were ESTJs, or well, one of them was an ESFJ, um, just to begin to manage and be aware of the soul, the personality of this thing, this corporate, in her case, the team, um, so we could manage it. Right, with the time kicking on, I just want to take a few minutes uh, to take some questions. Could you help me here, Natalie, and feed me with a few questions? Because I can't get my chat box up. <laughs> of or, course I can. Shall I stop sharing the slides? Sorry? Shall, I stop, shall I stop sharing the slides so we can all see you and each other? Yeah, yeah please yeah. do that, yeah. Okay. There we go. Let's have a look. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat for us. Someone's just saying they've got, sorry, they've got to leave, Kev, but they're going to watch the rest on the recording and thanks so much. Okay. Um, and someone else just said a great session. Thank you very much. The, there is one question here. Um, what does it mean if you match your organisation? I am ESFJ and so is my assessment of my organisation. Great. Here's, here's what to do is to milk it. Um, meaning you've landed yourself in an organization probably i don't know about the recruitment process but they spotted they probably didn't do your personality profile at interview but they would spot something within you and um, anyway the point being if you find yourself in that is it doesn't happen always is literally to milk it and to you know simply go with the soul of the organization because you're aligned. And so that, that's how we'll do that. There's some cautionary tales around it. Remember I told about that team that ended up with a load of NFPs is that um, I think if you are, is it ESFJ and you end up in an organization that's ESFJ is always be asking, what are we missing? You know, a bit of introversion would go a long way a bit of fresh ideas intuition maybe so uh but hey love it to bits and enjoy natalie any other one yeah thanks kevin it is he's just said i mean matt feel free to come off if you'd like to but he's just said that must be why i've been there for 19 years <laughs> yeah. um we've got another comment from joe if anyone wants to ask these out loud please do come off mute um otherwise i'll carry on reading them um, so the only difference between me and my organisation is I'm F and the organisation is T. As I'm a HR director, I think that probably works, question mark. Yeah, um, I think, why do we even think about the personality of our organisation, indeed our own personalities, is that uh, because we want to kind of be making a difference or have a good impact or improve performance. And so um, when you find a discrepancy is, and I've got here three Fs for all of us, where we find a discrepancy between ourselves, maybe one dimension, two dimensions, four dimensions against the organization, three things to do. Number one, and some of you will be doing this, is you fight it. I don't know what, you fight the organization. And that's fine because some organizations need fighting. It might be that that's why you're in there. But that's one thing you can do is fight to redress where you think things are not complete or um, uh, have that kind of wholeness about it that you would want to bring in. So you fight. Number two, and I think um, probably of the three items, this is the one I would initially plump for is the is to fashion is to use your difference and cognitive diversity to bring difference and to ask the nasty question and but to fashion it and what i mean by that is i'm not going to change it overnight i'm not going to fight uh but i'm going to fashion i'm going to drop in seed by seed drop by drop thought by thought my difference and um, 
that's something that you could choose to do. That's an approach very different to fighting. It's fashioning the organization. And thirdly, don't be um, alarmed by this, is to flee. And I have had people even on workshops like this where they come up to you after and say, Kev, thanks very much. I've learned about myself, my organization. I'm in the wrong organization. And I, I, this workshop's not set up to disappoint or disaffect you and your organization. But if you can't fight and you haven't got the energy or you've been fighting and it's not working and you haven't got enough people to help you fashion the organization, then go look somewhere else would be the thing. So time-wise, we're coming to an end here and um, thank you for your attention. Uh, it, I think it is recorded this mm -hmm. and I do want to just capture, <laughs> no more questions, but seven things that you can do. Uh, so either you can write these down or be, just be challenged by them. Um, if you haven't already, find out the type of your organization and study it. You know, if you have a child, you should study your child. If you have a hobby, you study your hobby. You have an organization, you should study it, meaning you should have a, some vocabulary to describe it. So in Oak Ridge, we talk about it's uh, extroversion, it's activity and people oriented type of stuff. We have words to describe the organization. Number one, find out your type. Number two, said it already, if you fit and where you align, milk it. Volunteer more because you're aligned already. Uh, and don't be shy, but um, push that which aligns with your organization. Three is the fight, fashion or flee. Make a decision where you um, come up against your organization. Number four, further research. This sounds crazy. Google your letters, you know, ENTJ, ISFP, whatever you are. There's so much reading out there. Um, I'm probably whistling in the wind for you extroverts there who would never read up about it. You'd want to talk to somebody. But you introverts, um, lots of reading, lots of study, lots of reflection. Uh, find out about that. Uh, uh, if I think, Natalie, if you haven't already, if you could put that free Myers Big Questionnaire link on. Yeah, Thank just you. done Finally, it. Chat one. Amazingly, these days, you can go online to the link that Natalie's put up, and for nothing, you can confirm your anecdotal four letters. So, Kim, I notice your INFP. If you've got any doubt about it, go on that link, 10 minutes, ding, 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 check it out. Um, Number six is absolutely critical, is work out the personality types of your family. Now that could be a partner. Usually your partner you will find is diametrically opposed anyway. I mean, that's just how it happens. Opposites attract and you have to live with them, so to speak. Um, so, but your mother and your father, whether they're alive or not, whether you're disaffected or very close to them, is work it out. Why? Well, because of the relationship, number one. Number two, because of the learning for you personally. You, you're thinking about someone really close to you. And here's the thing. You immediately see the alignments where you get on with them and where the conflicts are. So you're getting used to it. You're practicing the gentle art of personality noticing. And that's going to help you in your business and your organization. And so without even thinking about it, you start spotting in organizations, ah, oh, that's extroversion, or oh, that's judging, whatever. And finally, contact the Oak Ridge Centre. <laughs> Get in touch with me. Natalie has kindly put my contact details there. Uh, there's more of this stuff available, and we'd love to be able to just talk with you and help you, number one, identify more about your personality on probably one-to-one -one coaching, Number two, team coaching, team dynamics, personality differences within the team, how to manage that. And particularly for probably senior managers amongst you, how to manage your impact within the corporate soul or personality of your organization. Thank you very much. Slightly run over by a minute. Nice to be with you. And quickly back to Sean. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, all that remains to, to say is thank you so much to Kevin. Um, thank you for um, providing a great session. Thank you to all of you for attending. Um, and thank you to the Oak Ridge Centre. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Kevin. Bye, everybody. Bye.